first want to thank all of the panelists, of course, for taking your time to, to join us today. Um, this is the inaugural remote roundtable, so it means a lot to me that you guys uh, offered your time and expertise to, to help us kick this off. And um, certainly something we're excited to be hosting and making uh, a monthly occurrence, um, all with the very real goal of, of helping teams of all sizes uh, better understand what it means to operate a, a distributed and remote team and hopefully to do so with more efficiency and less stress. Um, so definitely a community that we're looking to build. Um, recordings will be made available uh, for, for everybody in the near future. Um, the registration link for the next webinar will be coming out shortly um, and the topic will be shared at the end of this discussion. Um, so yeah, let's uh, jump into this straight away. So. Um, so today I'm, I'm certainly super honored to, to have a really fantastic roster um, of some really sharp guys, um, all of whom have quite different experiences working uh, with all kinds of different engineering teams, um, some remote, some distributed, um, some work from home, and we can talk a little bit about some of those nuances throughout this discussion. Um, so I want to kind of make sure we've got a lot to cover today. So I'm, I'm gonna briefly introduce everybody um, and then we'll, we'll go straight into the conversation. So um, first we've got a, let me pull this up here. So there we go. So first we've got a, we've got Brendan, who's uh, joining us from the East Coast. Um, and Brendan works with engineers of all kinds um, as a senior developer evangelist, at one of the real leaders in uh, the remote space and particularly the remote engineering space, which is GitLab. Um, we also have Michael Rice joining us from Los Angeles. Uh, and Michael leads a, remote engineering team focused on Kubernetes. Um, I always feel like I mispronounced that, <laughs> but um, Michael works at, at VMware and thanks for joining us. Uh, we also have Michael Grunich who uh, works, uh, not works, he uh, is the founder and the CEO of, uh, of WorkOS, a, a really cool product that I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about um, later in the discussion. Um, we also have one of my, my good friends and one of my favorite people I've, I've had the opportunity to work with, um, which is Jason. Jason Bond Pratt, who um, most recently was on a sabbatical as a father, um, which has been awesome. And um, him and I worked together when he was uh, the EVP of engineering at BitMEX, which is the world's largest uh, cryptocurrency exchange. And Jason has some really interesting experience working with and uh, managing teams across all kinds of different locations and configurations. Um, and then we've got Ho Zhang. Um, and Ho Zhang, of course, is the, the CTO and, and co-founder of Merico, where, where I work. Um, and brings some pretty unique experience because um, he is working across different different languages um, and with teams in India, France, and China, as well as the US. Um, and I've seen him pull it off each and every day, so I'm sure he'll have some uh, great contributions to the discussion. So um, without kind of skipping too much more of our time, we'll uh, jump straight into the first discussion point. And um, for this first one, I, I want to kind of kick it off with, uh, with our friend Michael Greenwich here. Uh, Michael, you've uh, you've worked remotely as a leader for for a few years now, um, and I imagine you've certainly experienced both the the good, the bad, and the challenges of what it means to be you know a remote leader and a remote contributor. So I'm curious to to hear from you. You know, um, what things have you found that have really kind of helped you to both maximize kind of the benefits of this? You know, having a fun and quality work remote life, and also kind of what things have you seen that work for kind of feeling productive and connected. Yeah, I have a ton of thoughts on here. I feel like I could, at this point, like write a book um, if I wasn't so busy, but happy to chat through a few of them. Um, so I think one thing, you know, thinking about building distributed teams and remote work is asking yourself why you're doing it. Now, right, right now, everyone is obviously moving towards this due to the COVID outbreak. Um, we've been working remotely for over a year with our team growing. And there's a few different reasons we decided to do that. Um, and specific benefits we got from it. I think the first one um, was really just like access to talent to be able to grow a company quickly. Uh, I live in San Francisco, but constraining you know your talent to live in the Bay Area um, is is uh, really can slow down the growth of a company. And there's amazing people everywhere in the world to work with. Um, I think another question is what type of remote work you're going to do. So we work synchronously uh, as opposed to something like GitLab, which is built to be asynchronous. And it's a very, very different model. And so there's, it seems like that could maybe be a subtle distinction, but it's actually extremely, extremely important. And so thinking about why you're gonna do it and actually how you're gonna do remote work is, is uh, um, 
I think it's important to narrow those down first when you start thinking about tools and techniques. Um, so we work synchronously. We do a ton of stuff over Zoom. We're only hiring in essentially United States time zones, which simplifies it for a lot of team members. Um, and in terms of maximizing the benefits, for us, it's really not about cost, right? You don't really save that much money remote working. You could say, you know, you save money on office space. We actually give workers a pretty wonderful budget for setting up a home office because getting a home workspace set up is really key. So um, that's the first point there. Second point is in terms of like what, what we actually do every day or every week to make, make oneself productive. Um, I'll just chat about kind of a few things that I do that I found over the last year to help my own routine um, so I don't go stir crazy, um, you know, and, uh, and also can work just really effectively in a, a high stress, high growth environment, which is a startup. Um, so the first thing that I do um, every day actually is I still commute to work. And even though um, I work from home, so you know I'm, I'm in the same um, same apartment as where I, I sleep and where I live, um, I actually leave the house every morning. So I put my shoes on, I get dressed. Um, usually what I would do is I would commute by walking to a cafe that's like three or four minutes away, grab a cup of coffee, walk home. And so by the time I walk home, it's I've essentially commuted to work. I've kind of put my mind space in you know, the workspace, I'm like dressed, so I'm not working in my pajamas, right? I'm actually wearing like real shoes, get a little bit of fresh air. And I find that that distinction, even though I'm working in the same space that, you know, I, I woke up in, um, or the same, same apartment that I woke up in, um, has this kind of like mental shift that happens. So that's one thing I encourage everyone to do is, to, is still to commute in the sense of uh, move, move outside the space. And it means when I come back into my apartment, you know, I have a cup of coffee in one hand, I'm ready to go to work. Um, next thing I would say is natural light. Um, so I'm surrounded here by bay windows um, with a ton of light on my face. It helps for, um, I would say like just good lighting for like Zoom calls, but also be able to look out, see trees, see people on the street, it makes you feel like you're not isolated. So some people right now working from home are working from like a closet um, or you know a random room in their house. Um, you can do it for a little while, it's really not sustainable. So put a lot of care into simple things like that. And for me, natural light is a big one of them. Um, another thing I would say is drink water, <laughs> just like another simple kind of thing. Um, if you're not up and down moving to comps turns back and forth, you don't realize how um, you can really become dehydrated talking all day and the first sign of dehydration is getting cranky and if you're a leader that's really not a good thing to do with the team. So I have a water bottle that just sits here by my desk all the time. Um, and if I haven't gone through that by lunchtime, I know I'm probably dehydrated. Um, so that's another just kind of random tip. And the last thing I was going to say is just like you commute to start your day, it's really useful to have a routine to end your day. Um, for me, you know, I work with people on the East Coast a lot. I live in California, so I work a little bit earlier. So my day usually ends at like 4.30 or so. Um, and usually what I do is um, go do some yoga or go running. And so my best tool for running distributed teams, my number one productivity hack is probably my running shoes. Um, cause what that lets me do is actually end my day. I step away from my computer. It's kind of like when people leave work and go to the gym and then go home. Um, you know, I can still think about like work stuff and kind of process stuff, you know, kind of flush stuff to disc in a way, um, uh, while I'm jogging, it doesn't have to be long. It could be like 20, 30 minutes, something, something pretty short. Um, but by the time I get home, then I'm no longer in work mode. My computer's been off. I haven't been answering Slack messages for half an hour. So the team knows I'm not around anymore. Um, and it essentially has that book end point. And creating those routines every day to do those same things, I think, um, having consistency is, is really how I found a, a way to stay really, really productive and really focused and not have work blend into, you know, the, um, the times kind of before and after that. So after I get back from running, I can still have dinner, you know, um, chat with my friends and family, not feel like I'm still, still working. So those are a few tips and techniques I would say. There's no silver bullets or anything, really. It's just kind of... Um, what you would expect to take care of yourself and uh, all else will follow from that. Absolutely. No, I, I, I love that point of kind of creating a little bit of a rhythm to, to kind of quote unquote commute, commute work. And I can, I can kind of certainly relate to bookend. Um, I think one of the things I've found to be one of my kind of key recipes for success is, you know, whenever I fall out of that rhythm where, you know, I always make sure that I'm, you know, showered, dressed in work mode, you know, sitting in the usual place that I kick start my day you know, with a cup of coffee. And it's always religiously before 9am. And if I'm, you know, for whatever reason, even if I'm, you know, busy, and I don't get showered and dressed, or I'm not quite 
composed in the right way before 9am, I notice it completely disrupts the day and makes me feel like I'm less productive. Um, Jason, Brendan, or, or, uh, or Michael Rice over there, curious, curious for you guys, um, before we transition into the next topic, like if you guys have found kind of similar things, uh, Michael, I see you've got a cup of coffee there. I'm wondering if kind of strolling to Starbucks perhaps is one of your kind of key things each morning, but would love to, love to hear from you guys. How do you start your days? Yeah, co coffee is definitely mandatory. Um, <laughs> although strolling to get coffee these days is kind of tricky because uh, you know, at least for Starbucks, you gotta, you gotta get in your car. Um, yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, I've noticed that like when, um, so my day is kind of weird because I'll, I'll basically work, once I started working rem remotely, I was working a lot, right? And I still work a lot. So like I get to work late into the night and then I just kind of roll into the morning and the days and the, there's no real good boundaries for me, but then the nature of my job is kind of like that these days. But yeah, if you, um, I have noticed if I, if I get off on the wrong foot in the morning or I'm unfocused or, you know, I have kids and the kids are running around being crazy. <laughs> It just crushes my day. So I definitely agree on that point. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to have uh, a basement. So I'm in, I'm in suburban America. <laughs> uh, so I don't, I don't get to stroll to get coffee, which I would love. Uh, but I do get to have a physical separation because I'm in my basement and the kids don't necessarily have a reason to come down here unless it's to bother me. Uh, and so I get to get to walk downstairs on my, on my commute. So I, I agree with the commute aspect. Absolutely. And that, that actually transitions us perfectly to kind of the next point of our discussion. And Brendan, when, when you and I first connected, um, it was, it was through your, your webcam where I got to see your, your home office setup, um, which is, is super cool. And um, we had a really interesting discussion kind of talking about the importance of creating those boundaries and creating kind of the, the kind of clear points of distinction between your kind of life life and your work life. And, I, I think it's it's also an important discussion too as a as a manager of people to be thinking about, you know, how you can, you know, whether it's through the way that you're leading and the processes you implement as a manager or kind of the way that you're configuring your kind of communication channels to kind of create some of these boundaries so that people aren't just getting pummeled, you know, every single day, every single minute. And um so I'd love to kind of, you know, Brendan, if you're if you're up for it, we can kind of lead in there and um talk about, you know, whether it's offices, whether it's slack channel default you know settings whether it's you know mental practices you know what what can people do and what should they be thinking about when it comes to kind of creating these boundaries to begin and end the days and not burn out their people yeah no that i you hit the nail on the head there i think you know the key is there can be uh amazing focus achieved right when we're working remotely uh that's something that all of us uh as either engineers or managers or engineers or like myself fancy myself an amateur engineer, right? Like that we can understand the huge value that comes with flow and the ability to achieve focus. Uh, I think it's critical to carve out that dedicated workspace to do that. And that can be hard, right? Again, like I said, I'm really lucky. I've got this basement because <laughs> I'm in suburban America. But even if you're in an apartment, um, you know, where you may not have another room to be an office, you know, carving out that workspace, a desk that's for work, um, uh, you know, maybe there's a, even if it's like a curtain behind you, right? Just something simple to make a physical separation. Um, you'd be surprised how much human biology relies on those physical separations, right? Some of us, uh, have experienced this when you walk out of a room and you forget what you were thinking about. And if you walk back into that same room, uh, you remember, right? That's biologically part of how our brains work. And so when it comes to like maintaining a healthy balance and a boundary between work and life when you're doing them both in the same location. Uh, I think those physical boundaries, like it's not, you can't underestimate the value of that. It seems so simple, uh, but it's, it's hard to underestimate the value of that. And that's what really allows you to achieve focus. Now the inverse side of that is also separating work from your life. Right. Uh, and that's, that's something that can be really tough. Um, and as, but as critical as leaders and as, you know, employees ourselves to prevent burnout, right? Like Michael said, you're, you could, all, you're always, you're always at work, right? Uh, so you, you're always, you know, that close to your workspace. Um, you're theoretically available, right? And so creating the right boundaries um, there are really important too, right? So, it, you know, things, I think Max, when you and I were talking, I was talking about how 
you know, maybe if you work from home all the time, maybe you don't need Slack or email on your phone, right? That's a big ask. And for those of us that may travel or used to travel uh, for a living, that may be a big ask. But, you know, when you're at home and you're with your family, um, <clears throat> if your desk is right there, uh, not that far away, maybe you could continue to embrace that boundary by, you know, learning better techniques and, and focusing on better techniques about stepping away from work. Um, and then I think just having those boundaries also help the people that you live with, right? So uh, I have four small children, two of which normally are home with me because they're really small. Um, not home with me, but at this home where I'm working. Uh, and right now everybody's home, right? Uh, and so that can be, it can be really frustrating for them or for you if that boundary isn't kind of well established and they understand, you know, when you're working, right? And I've had this conversation with my eight-year-old a couple of times since, since this uh, home, stay at home uh, order started, which is like, I normally am working. When you're at work, school for six hours a day, I work all of that time, buddy. And so I can't just be available right away. And so finding that balance um, and, and really making sure you structure your, your day in a way that makes sense for you. Um, you know, again, we talk about a lot at GitLab, we focus on asynchronous, right? Uh, this helps a lot of our employees, especially because we don't limit our hiring to time zones. So we have someone in basically every time zone. Um, you know, it helps our employees kind of be that manager of one and structure their day. If the first default is to have asynchronous communication where we're going to write things down, uh, allow for time, not assume anyone's available uh, unless you've scheduled something with them ahead of time, right? So we, we live by our calendar and by, um, you know, what we've scheduled uh, to, to know um, when people are available rather than assuming that everyone's available from eight to five, you know, in your time zone um, is critical. Absolutely. No, I think, I think that's a really interesting point that you bring up too, that I personally haven't heard kind of discussed and it makes a lot of sense, which is this idea that, you know, if, if your work environment is, you know, in your pocket on your phone and you work from home, that almost means you can never escape it no matter what you do. And I, I think that's a really important distinction to talk about, you know, which is, yeah, if, if your employees are, you know, home-based, you know, maybe, maybe enforce that, maybe encourage that, this idea that, okay, your computer, you know, that you do your primary work on. Oh, I think we might have lost Maxon. Max oh, yeah. poor Maxon. Yeah. I was just going to say, <laughs> I was going to follow so up my, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to follow up my quote and say, I'm saying this, but I also do have Slack on my phone. So like, I'm, I also am not necessarily <laughs> practicing what I preach, but I think it's well, good to, whatever the right boundary is for you all is, is really critical. Plus like, when you work in an office, those boundaries, it's the exact same topic. How do I draw, mm -hmm. how do I draw a boundary? It doesn't matter if I walk to work exactly. or drive to work or have two phones or not, it's the exact same issue. Mm -hmm. and, and so at home, it's really funny. I find people, sorry to just wax here, but I don't know, it's kind of no, good. conversation. That's no, great. I, I find that people, as soon as you switch to a work from home, especially work from home mindset, it's all of a sudden, it's like, all right, how do I draw boundaries? How do I draw boundaries? How do I draw boundaries in a way that like you never think about, you know, especially if you're running, say, a 24-7, always up system, the, these types of things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question for you, Brendan. How do you at GitLab, this is, I guess, not your topic, but I'm curious. Um, how, do we, how do you create sort of shared moments of, of success with people? How do you kind of celebrate things together? And we just launched that new thing. And how do you create sort of visceral human excitement as opposed to maybe an email that sounds really celebratory, but no one's going to, you know what I mean? How do you, how do you, how do you engineer, how do you manage that moment? That's it's a great, question. That's a really, really great question. And yeah, I mean, I, the, I start in by generally saying we talk about communication at GitLab more than I've ever done at any company I've ever worked for. Um, which is, you might see as like a, Oh, well, that's just a lot of cycles and, and if any of you have met Sid, you know that he would love to spend a cycle on something like that or many, many cycles. Um, but I think it's been really helpful for us to understand, like we're, we're going to talk about how we communicate a lot. And what that also means is we have to be super intentional because we're all remote about how we engineer exactly those things, right? So we do engineer those moments, right? We have a, not only the moments of celebration where, you know, if we're going to have a company-wide announcement, 
um, it's going to be multimodal, right? Maybe it's in a company call and it's in the Slack uh, and you help, you know, distribute it to your team members in case they missed it. Um, but we also like force and engineer the social aspect of our lives together too, right? So we have daily a call that is focused on not work, right? Like it's intentionally um, not a work-related call, but a get-to-know-you call. So this, it's changed a lot over the years. So I've been at GitLab since 2017 when we were about 150 people. Uh, we're now um, over 1,200 people. Um, so that, that's changed. It used to be everyone shared something about their day every uh, so often. That would obviously break down really quick question of does it scale then is, is no. Um, but we do have these take a break calls every day still. Um, and we have three of them actually to make them time zone friendly depending on where you are. Um, and they're just like, they're open Zoom rooms that have a topic, right? So um, one is travel. That might be a less, less talked about one these days. Uh, but there's a family and friends one. There's one where you can just talk about like coffee and tea and cooking and that kind of stuff. Um, there's like a hobbies one. Um, and so that's really critical things that we do. And again, it's intentionally, it's engineering those social interactions you would otherwise have. Um, and then I think that the same holds true when it comes to celebrating, right? Um, again, we, we would do that in a multimodal way. We would do that on those, you know, company-wide calls. Um, now, the other thing we used to do, or we did do, and we hope to do again soon, uh, is we would get together every year um, the entire company. So we had, we had actually planned um, to be in Prague in the Czech Republic uh, about a week or two ago. Obviously that did not happen. Um, we canceled that a while back um, given everything that's going on, but that also, you know, we also value that face-to-face -face time. Um, and again, it's, it's something that we're not, we're also not getting along with everyone else that might be remote only. Um, but we, we put a big value on, right? That's a huge investment to take the whole company uh, for a week and go somewhere um, and again, very focused. There, there are some days that are about work there, but there's also specifically days when we're together that are excursions that are not about work. They're go, you know, it was going to be, well, I've been to a few of them, um, most recently New Orleans. So we had lots of different fun things to do in New Orleans, uh, Cape Town, South Africa, and uh, Greece, right? And so those are, those had excursions to go out and do things that are not work related. And that's how you can really get to know people. Uh, the other thing that we do is we have a, um, again, it's, <laughs> it's not uh, enabled right now, but when uh, folks can travel, we have a travel grant so that if you go and visit um, a, a GitLab team member, we'll, GitLab will actually cover a certain uh, amount of your travel, um, like per team member, right? So for instance, like- That is a great idea. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's of course all in our handbook. For those of you that don't know, our handbook is all public and on the web. Uh, on our website, and you can read all about it if you just Googled uh, GitLab Travel Grant, I think. Yeah, uh, you'd find it probably. Um, and, and so that's really fantastic and encourages people to, to go and meet each other, right? Like I uh, took the train up to New, I'm in Washington, D.C., took the train up to New York for one of their co-working days. So again, something we would do prior to all this is uh, in big cities, there'll be co-working days together. Uh, so New York, Denver, um, uh, Florence, Rome, Amsterdam. There, there's, there's pockets of GitLab team members that get together on a regular basis for co-working days. Uh, well, I'm not super close because again, I'm in suburban America, but I took a train to New York and GitLab paid for that train because I met up with 10 GitLab team members there in New York. Yeah, that's- so uh, Face-to-face that's... time is still valuable. You just got to make, engineer it. <laughs> We do something uh, similar. We have a remote happy hour that we do once a week where we're a relatively small teams or about a dozen people. And uh, it's pretty fun. People just get on Zoom and usually use like funny face filters. The Snap camera works with Zoom on the, on the Mac. So hmm. you can like put weird, not just weird backgrounds, but funny stuff on your face. <laughs> That's a huge tip. <laughs> yeah. And um, the we also I didn't know that. We usually just play like games, silly games online together. Like one of our favorite things to do is play type racer. I don't know if you all have done this. It's just like a typing speed game. It's really silly, <laughs> um, but you can all do it together and it counts down and you can see everyone in Zoom frantically trying to type and, and stuff like that. It's kind of, you know, it's like when you go to a bar and you're hanging out with people, the game that you're playing doesn't really matter. If you're playing shuffleboard or darts, it doesn't matter. 
It's just like doing something together. It's the same kind of thing. You can just do it over Zoom. Yeah, we just did trivia the other day, which again, we hadn't necessarily done, but our fantastic corporate events team who had planned a Prague and then disassembled Prague, then put together this, uh, you know, trivia day for people because they, they were feeling, uh, you know, left out that nobody got to experience what they had put together. This is really interesting for me, the way um, Brandon described the multimodal approach for engineering that moment almost reminds me of the movie Inception. Like when you do, people are in different level of dreams, like you're in different time zones and you have to do this multi-level kick so that at the same time, so that all the team members would wake up together. That's really interesting. <laughs> it's a good way to look at it for sure. And um, this actually translates, I, I think we've almost to a certain degree kind of jumped straight into this, but um, it, it brings up, I think one of the most critical challenges, you know, when it comes to working remote, either as a individual contributor or as a manager of a large team, I, I think the, the challenge remains the same, which is this idea of, you know, how do you, how do you by design and, and properly engineer these moments where you can build a rapport as a team and you can, you know, have proper dynamics with the people reporting to you or the people working with you and kind of what things can you be thinking about, whether it's, you know, having certain one-on-ones, et cetera. Like love to hear from, from you guys and, and Michael Rice, perhaps you can, uh, kick us off here if you're comfortable. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear everybody kind of talk a little bit about this and in a bit more detail, you know, how do you, how do you build this rapport when people may not have even ever met in person once in their lives? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I'd be happy to, but you know, it's kind of funny, like as we're talking, like, so my kids are home from school and I, right outside the window is my backyard and I can see my kid, my like seven year old, she's on her mom's phone on her zoom call to school on the swing. <laughs> and I was just thinking, it's probably <laughs> not what they had in mind with the kids attending Zoom classes. Anyway, yeah, so these are strange times, right? I mean, and one thing I was gonna mention that I haven't heard yet is, um, you know, it's kind of funny. I started working remotely full-time probably in 2014 or so, so about six years ago. Um, and like, for me, I was like, I was so happy to work remote. Like that was what I was trying to do for such a long time you know, to get out of the office politics. And by the way, little kid politics are not a whole lot different, I've found. <laughs> Just different, different, different scale of problems, I guess, but similar uh, genesis. Um, but I wanted to work remotely so bad that like, it's kind of interesting to watch people talk about working remotely today, like on Twitter, or out in the media or wherever, um, and kind of the struggles they're going through. Because I think I probably went through a lot of the same struggles, but because I was so happy to work remote, I didn't care. You know, I like, I just like kind of just brushed them under the table and just figured out my own way to deal with them without really discussing it with anybody. But, um, but it is, it's fun to listen to the conversation because it's brought me back to, um, you know, kind of my own journey. I know we use the word journey too much, but kind of my own experience. And I think the insight that I heard um, earlier um, about the difference between working synchronously and asynchronously is like, I think it's spot on. And I, I can describe it in this way. When I was at Red Hat, so I was at a big software company called Red Hat, um, it was kind of part of the field engineering team. So, you know, a lot of the work we were doing was with customers kind of in real time, even if it was remotely. So there's a, a fair amount of interaction all the time anyway. And um, the only difference was you just weren't, you might've been in the office for a few weeks, but then you would be gone for a few weeks. Um, so that was one experience and that, that didn't seem a whole lot different from, you know, a general work environment other than you're not fussing over the coffee machine or worrying about <laughs> whether the ice, they clean the ice machines out very well, stuff like that. Um, or the, you know, trying to avoid that one person in the corner cubicle and kind of walking around or having to listen to people's, you know, chatter in, in a cubicle environment. Um, I luckily got to miss the open office floor plan <laughs> situation, so I didn't do too much of that. But, um, but then I went to a startup and the startup, I really love the team. I love, this is not to take anything away from them if they ever watch this recording, but um, it was truly like an asynchronous, decentralized, um, global comp uh, team. And so everything was asynchronous, very few, I only had one person in my time zone, um, a lot of people on the other side of the world. And, you know, honestly, um, that was tough. Like, so I was, I was writing a lot of code back then, so this is only about a year ago. And, um, 
You know, it's funny because I, I've since, if you, if you know me, I, I write a lot about these kind of topics about tech leadership and, and stuff like this. And I, I kind of go off on weird, <laughs> weird topics, but I've been discovering this thing that I call like the blue zone leadership. And what you find out is, um, you know, it's kind of interesting to be really effective at writing code or doing any kind of creative work. You kind of activate the, they're actually kind of like, I don't know what the emotions are, but they would be kind of like blue zone emotions. So you, you may be like not feeling, it's not really depressed, but it's kind of those similar emotions. And that's what lets you solve really creative problems and like hmm. have empathy for your customers. So you put yourself in this kind of like blue state, right? And for a lot of us, it's like focus and it's not a bad state, but the problem is when you, when you combine that blue zone with like, like <laughs> you know, so I think you get, you know, I would find at the end of the day is I was pretty drained, not because, um, you know, I, I could organize my work, I get focused, I had a co-working place, you know, so I had people around me, but yet they weren't, they may have been around me, but it's like going to a party and being lonely. They're out they're around me and they're talking, but I'm not part of their world. And I'm so focused on like grinding out this code or trying to solve these hard problems that, you know, it didn't, it, it was more like just working in a coffee shop, you know, it's a bunch of strangers. And so um, what I kind of latched onto is, um, some ways to kind of address that. Let's see, I have, um, I think what, what works really well is the stuff that I, like I usually talk about. And I think if you, I think as humans, we need to feel like we're part of something. And I don't necessarily think just jumping on a Zoom call fixes it because I think everybody's different in terms of how they interact with each other and what they need from, from their tribe or their group or whatever. And so I think as a manager or a tech lead or whatever role you're in, if you're, if you're in a leadership seat, you know, I think the first thing is like, make sure you're like, I mean, this is just me speaking, but make sure you get really engaged. So one thing I do is I write this totally long TLD, TLDR letter on Mondays, although I missed yesterday's letter, but I write it to my team. I'm like, Hey, here's what's going on in my life. Here's what's going on in the company. It's just me being super transparent as if, we were just sitting in the office or sitting around, like I try to be really conversational and like as if we're sitting around the coffee machine at work, right? Um, but then also like that's kind of like the one way blast and I like to use email. Uh, we've had a lot of conversations about whether it should be on Slack or should I record it or something. Um, there's something about the email that to me, maybe I'm just getting a little old, but it has a kind of more form formal sense of like, here's a letter, here's today's, here's this week's letter. Um, keeping that cadence, I think, is super important because, like I said, at the last company I was at, it was kind of like the weeks would just kind of go on and we were doing stuff and we had kind of deadlines, but it just, it wasn't really clear to me what was going on or what the vision was or, you know, how I fit in other than like my very narrow little space that I was working on. Um, so that's the first one. So making sure you have like a really clear vision, not just for the company, but for like the team and for the individuals on the team. And then two is listen a lot. And so by listening, I mean, just really like proactively engaging them, you know, whether, however they like to be engaged. So whether it's like Slack, you, you know, you have to learn your team. Some of my team likes to get on Zoom calls and do video. Some don't like doing video. Some don't like doing Zoom. Some just want to talk on Slack. Some, you know, just use different modes. So, you know, adapting to the mode that works with them on the timing that works for them. And they're all going to be a little different, right? And maybe even different messages require different kinds of way, you know, if you have to deliver, you know, a, a bad message or a good message, you're going to do different modes, right? So be, being really flexible in that way. And then finally, um, what I, it's an activity I call tracking and adjusting. So like I said, when you're off working alone, let's say you've got a, a team of developers that are all working on say like one code base, but they've got different modules or whatever, however you've got it structured, however you've like, you know, done the code organization when they are not together, they miss the opportunity to like, you know, reach and, you know, <laughs> talk over like, Hey, what are you doing on Right. You know, like that's the whole idea of the open office space. When that's gone, it requires somebody to actually like get on a zoom connection and reach out to a developer. And I think watching the panelists here, I think we're all, we, <laughs> we all seem pretty engaging. And I think that's not a problem for any of you, but I think if you think back to early in your career, if you were like a junior developer, sometimes you can be very, uneasy about reaching out to people because you don't want to look like you don't know what you're doing. You don't want to, you know, you've got your, you've got imposter syndrome or whatever, whatever is affecting you or inhibiting you. You're not going to be proactively doing it. So as a leader, 
you know, really doing it remotely actually increases your work level a lot because you have to like, be, you know, I don't I want to say constantly, but like be prepared to do it as much as needs to be done to like reach out to people like, Hey, what are you working on? Not, not to micromanage, but like, Hey, what's going on? Are you having any struggles, any challenges? Can I support you? Can I jump on the call with you? You know, just bring that kind of supportive mentality to what you're doing. And I think even when you have remote teams, I think they're going to feel pretty engaged and that's the key, right? Because you're going to, in remote, the risk of um, your team becoming really disengaged is very high, especially if they're deep in that blue zone. So those are my points of view. Absolutely. You know, that's a great point. And um, something I definitely want to kind of highlight there and maybe see if anyone else has similar kind of things they've done or seen. Um, certainly new for me, so I, uh, thanks for sharing it, Michael, is this idea of um, kind of kickstarting the week with this kind of written communication. You know, I think we talked about these kind of boundaries and routines to kind of get your day going. And that to me kind of jumps out as like a really cool and interesting way to kind of let everybody know like, okay, like the week has begun, like let's get rolling. And I um, love, love that idea. And I'm curious for the rest of the panel, um, what, what have you guys kind of seen in kind of different ways, you know, whether it's, you know, setting up these kind of individual meetings and kind of figuring out how to connect with your developers and a question I certainly have that I'm curious to see if anyone has had experience with is also kind of. Oh, I want the question. This suspense is killing me. On the edge of my seat. <laughs> I know. This is this is going to be the question. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just going to add that I think I think the one on ones are really important. And yes, the format of of how you know it works best for them is is critical. Um, again, that can be tough for us when we have engineering managers that are managing folks across the globe. Um, but I, we really do value Zoom uh, and that like the close to face to face uh, that you get with, with Zoom because you can read emotions and, and understand how someone's really feeling. Um, but we also like, you know, encourage, you know, a very focused one on one, like, it's not necessarily prescriptive, but we do want folks to, you know, um, be able to not just share, not make the one-on-one -on -one just about, well, what did you do last week? What did you do this week, right? But make that one-on-one -on -one about that uh, personal aspect and how you're feeling, right? Like all of our, our leadership right now are really focused on making sure our team feels supported, uh, you know, through this crisis. Cause you know, I think it, it, it's something we haven't really talked about, but you know, even for those of us that are all remote, I think it's, it's been really tough, right? Dealing with, again, kids being at home, A, uh, and then the uncertainty of what's going on B. Uh, and so, you know, that that one-on-one is really the manager's opportunity to to reinforce that and reinforce your values, I think. Sorry, I dropped out there, guys. I'll have to yell at, <laughs> yell at Comcast later. Um, <laughs> what was the question? I, that you it's like everyone's working all, from home or something. Man. <laughs> I'm all on the, the tip of our toes trying to, we wanted to hear the question that you wanted to ask. But, oh yeah, Maxim. Oh, he's going to do it to us again. Frozen again. All right. I, I had a question. I had a, I had a question for you, Michael. You mentioned the, or uh, yeah, let me see. You mentioned the whole, you know, hey, what are you, you know, what are you up to kind of moment that you can have in person. And it's those little things. I might be the stealth sort of skeptic on the call, like for, it's because it's those little things that I miss so, so much. It feels like. Mm it's almost like being in, in solitary confinement. And even as an introvert, a total confirmed introvert, I absolutely miss those types of human to human interactions. In fact, I sort of need them. Otherwise you probably like become more reclusive. So that's been my biggest challenge working with remote teams and especially managing remote teams is going, okay, is this a, a decent moment to jump in? Like I need an answer to this question. Like I need a thing. I would normally glance across the room and see if someone's, sitting there with their headphones on or if they're up and about or they get coffee, I might grab an opportunity while they're on the way to the kitchen. There's lots of little things you can do in person that we forget about entirely. And then we go to this really formalized thing. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that I'm, I'm curious to you for any, for any of you guys, especially if you're trying to work synchronously, which is a massive, it's the thing we want to do. And it, but it's a, such a massive challenge. How do you handle that? Tips for that. Yeah. Things that we've done. So, um, the first thing is actually built into Slack. The Slack status uh, field is actually really useful. You can customize it. You can put a little emoji on it. People put, um, put this if they're like going to lunch or going for a walk. 
there's actually like a keyboard command to do it really fast. You just like do shift command Y and it pops up a little thing. Um, you can also set it to expire. So you can say, hey, I'm only gonna do this for an hour, pop it in, say I'm gonna be in a meeting. Um, that's one thing that, it's just like a low fidelity way to do this. Um, another thing that we uh, created is a channel called HALP, H-A-L-P, which is a help channel. Um, it's just a general like, hey, I need help with this thing or I have a general question to throw out. A lot of times they're like small things. It's like, hey, does anyone know where to get the W-2 or something? You know, it could be an HR thing. Um, it could be some random thing about IT, setting up your computer, it could be, be whatever. Um, and so kind of lowering the barrier to having like a defined channel for every single conversation helped a lot. And then the third thing we did is we actually have a channel called Aloha, um, which doesn't have any purpose except for people to say either hello or goodbye. And it's kind of just a nice thing when people like hop on in the morning, they just like wave and say, hey, like I'm here, what's going on? Or hey, you know, heading out for the day, gonna go for a jog. Um, cause otherwise in that status, you, you don't really get a way to say goodbye to your coworkers and it feels like you haven't left the office. It goes back to the thing I was talking about with routine, right? Walking in saying hi to your coworkers, leaving work saying goodbye. Um, and so we just use that channel for that. It's not required to post in it. Nobody tracks, like, are you saying hello or goodbye? Um, but creates this kind of, uh, uh I would say just lower level energy in the office. The last thing I, I, I forgot I was going to say, um, is we try to not use DMs. Um, private channels as much as possible. Uh, we constantly talk about it. We talk about it during our all hands. Really, DM should only be used for um, like sensitive HR data. Because if you're having a conversation with someone, um, probably there's other people that should be aware of it. It should probably be searchable. And if you go an entire day and everyone's talking in DMs inside of Slack, it'll feel like it's dead. And if you're just trying to get like enthusiasm from your coworkers and don't see anyone talking, you're like, are people even working today? Right? Am I the only one? Um, and so we push as much as possible into uh, public channels. And there's even tons of tons of channels. Some of them only have two or three people in it, but you know you have that awareness. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a challenge you've dealt with before too. Is sort of where is everybody on Slack? Where does the conversation happen? Right, like the you know the exchange is running slow, or there's like throwing errors, or what? Like where is this? Where's this happening right now? Where is everybody? Where you know where's the war room or whatever? So it can be really tough with a lot of those. Slack. Yeah. And it, it, I think it depends on your scale, right? Like for sure. So like Slack is where we live too. And we've written down that thing that, that Michael mentioned, like that we really, really discourage DMs. Uh, a lot of people's standard status is please don't DM me, <laughs> hit me in this channel. Um, and, and so we focus on that. And again, as we've scaled, we've gotten a lot more channels, um, which is both good and bad, right? Cause you have this kind of channel sprawl, um, but there's channels for interests, right? So again, we're, we're never together in the office. So like I'm in a woodworking channel. That's just about woodworking. Um, there's in the parenthood, which is like parents, which has been hugely beneficial. Uh, again, as, as we're all becoming homeschooling parents <laughs> overnight um, and, and just kind of supporting each other in that. Um, there's channels for, you know, all kinds of different things that are social. I love that Aloha channel, Michael. That's awesome. Um, that's a really cool idea. Uh, I'm probably going to bring it up slash maybe just create it. You're welcome to steal it. Go for it. <laughs> I will. I will. Good artist copy, great artist steal, right? So, um, yeah, no. So I think that's I think that's critical. But then to your point, Jason, it's like you got to have some sort of organization for that. So it's tough. Like uh, again, with 1,200 folks, like we've got there's some channel naming conventions, right? So we have like groups start with a G and an underscore. And, um, you know, that's the different engineering groups to get to. Um, and we have location based channels, right? So like, again, like I said, there's pockets of us. So there's like, I'm in the loc DMV channel for the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. Um, and so you end up with those kind of like this little bit of need for structure from Slack. Um, I've seen some previews of the stuff that's coming from, from them. And it, it looks really cool. Like they're helping with some of that channel organization. Um, but then it's really critical to also be able to, again, we talk about how we communicate a lot at GitLab. So we've got a production channel, which is where our, like all of our SREs are. And that's like where all the, the, the like alerting comes in, right? That's, that's production. Well, then there's also infrastructure lounge. That's where the SREs can hang out and chat and just kind of be together. And then there's incident management for like, if there is an active incident, 
we're in incident management. There's a Zoom call that's standing that's always in that room. That's the war room call, if you will. I don't think we call it a war room. What do we uh, pull it up? I can see what we call it. Probably just incident room. Situation room, right? The permanent Zoom for the situation room. So like if there is a production incident, um, it's very clear that those three channels are very different purpose or very different purposes, but theoretically they're for the same team, right? Um, now I'm not on that team, but I know that because now I know where I can go when I'm, because we're of course big users of GitLab at GitLab. So when I, GitLab takes a hiccup for me, I'm like, wait, <laughs> is there something going on or is it just me? Oh no, I got to yell at uh, Comcast, um, right? <laughs> like Maxim would. Uh, so, so yeah, I think, I think that's really critical again to kind of, find the balance between, you know, channel overload, but also making spaces for people to, to like share interests. Yeah, I, I love this idea. Um, one of the things I thought, saw once um, in one of my previous jobs that I thought was, you know, so simple yet so effective was whenever we had a really large project, you know, or something with a tight deadline, especially with a larger team, we would just stand up, a, you know, a Zoom conference room for the whole day or even for, you know, 48 hours, and we'd literally have someone in there who's like job, you know, sometimes it was an executive assistant, sometimes it was a subject matter expert on whatever we were tackling, but we would just have someone in there to kind of act as kind of the host of the room, you know, so if you needed to kind of ask any questions or you want to kind of quickly sit in and kind of figure out like, okay, what's the latest status, what's going on, that was a great way to connect. And um, the question I wanted to ask you guys, um, and we'll see if it's a cursed question that secretly crashes my internet, is um, <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to hear you know I think one of the big challenges of course is um, all of this makes great sense but but how do you how do you guys look out for a team member you know that maybe suddenly you know having having an issue or getting stuck or just kind of quietly fading into the background and maybe they're stuck on a task or maybe they're having trouble with something with their home life or you know maybe they're feeling you know left out of something but I I think it's perhaps more important in a remote dynamic than any other dynamic to be kind of be vigilant of that and think about, you know, okay, this person is disengaged or this person's upset or this person's stuck. But how do you guys look out for that? And, and what kinds of things have you found to be useful in kind of, you know, being more proactive there? That's a tough one. And I think those, <laughs> <laughs> I think the, so no answer. I think those things are also just to kind of underline that that those those things tend to start to erode trust in those team members that start to get a little quiet, maybe are missing a little, some deliveries, things like that. And again, I think normally in person, you would naturally sort of it's easier to put an arm around somebody, and it's easier for them to seek out help when everything is explicit, when everything is sort of it has to take an extra set of actions to interact with somebody. It's very I'm with you. It's very easy for those people to wither and. I, I, I've been sitting here while everyone was talking, wondering, it, sort of apropos to that, if you pre-screen, if you pre-screen for folks during the hiring process who are amenable to this kind of stuff, I'm sure the answer is it's tough or maybe you don't. I don't know how one would do that, but it's it's sort of like there are, there are folks for whom this doesn't work. Sorry, didn't mean to hijack your question, but that's no, no, that key it's, to me. It's how, do you, how do you handle dating folks? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely great. Um, and, and Jason, you, you kind of pulled the discussion forward pretty nicely there. And um, I'd like to toss this one to, to Brendan first with, with GitLab is, um, I like that you mentioned this idea of kind of pre-screening for, you know, having the right kind of traits to, to work nicely in this dynamic. And Brendan, I'm curious if there's anything that GitLab kind of does to determine, you know, is this person going to be comfortable and effective in a remote dynamic versus not? And, if you know, if any of you guys to to jump into the conversation too, if you've kind of noticed any traits or kind of common characteristics that make someone a you know a really poor fit for a remote dynamic versus being a great fit. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I I don't know that we have the answer. I wish we <laughs> did. I guess we should. Uh, but I I think that it's we the way we look at the questions may be a little bit different actually. Um, and so we again really focus on our values. Um, which is something that, you know, a lot of companies have written down. Uh, I've been at a lot of companies before that had values, but their GitLab is different in that we actually like talk about them all the time, um, like in everything we do. So our, our values for those that might not know are, uh, it's the acronym is credit. So it's collaboration results, efficiency, diversity and inclusion, iteration and transparency. 
And so remote is interestingly not in those values. And I think we've even written about why remote isn't, but those values kind of are required in this remote environment, I think, right? And so I don't think we have the values we have because we're remote, but I think the values we have have enabled us to be remote, all remote, um, if that makes sense. And so screening for values is like the number one thing we do in the recruiting process. And so where I think that over, uh, you know, intersects the most with remote is, you know, we talk about um, results as being like a manager of one. We talk about efficiency, about, um, you know, doing, uh, writing things down and being super efficient for the right group, um, using boring solutions when it makes sense. Uh, we talk about iteration, right? We have this, this concept that, uh, again, I've been an engineer a long time. We always talk about minimal viable products. We talk about minimal viable change at GitLab. So if you think minimal viable product, below that has, that has a number of minimal viable features. Even below that is the minimal viable change. Like, does this change make it better? well then ship it. That's kind of our, our mentality, which is different than some engineering groups I've been with before. Like was, there's even a quote from Nat Freeman, who's now the CEO of GitHub, but a quote from him in our values page um, that said, he said to Sid that we have a really low level of shame when it comes to shipping. And Sid loved that. He's like, yes, we do. We have no shame to ship something. Uh, all of these things help are, are the requirements I think of being successful remotely. Um, you have to, as an individual, be able to embrace that. And it's really hard for a lot of folks. Um, and so I think as we test for that, it, it most of the time tests for, you know, can you work remotely, right? You've got to be that kind of manager of one and, and be able to embrace these things. Um, but that doesn't always work out. I mean, I, I've, I've hired someone, this was years ago, who worked for us for a few months and then was like, literally said, I, I cannot do the remote thing. Like I can't do it. Um, so it's definitely not for everyone. Um, but I think when you kind of are looking for folks that can, you know, really drive, you know, a vision and, and own their role, um, that person can, is capable of thriving remotely if you do all these other things we've been talking about. It's an excellent point. It's an excellent point. I was, I was talking with a friend of mine just yesterday and you know, being kind of a remote evangelist, you know, it's like, oh, I'm so excited. Corona is going to make so many, you know, remote workers out of this. And, and he fired back at me, which I thought was fair. He goes, he goes, I don't know. He's like, I think maybe there's lots of people that are going to go never again. Um, it, so, so uh, Brendan, you and I kind of discussed this a little bit, and I'm, I'm curious to open this up for the group, but kind of talking a little bit about some of these distinctions and things for, you know, all of us to be thinking about, you know, and working with people and managing people, you know, during the quarantine, you know, like the weird things that are happening behind the scenes that make this, even though it's remote, it's not normal remote by any means. Yeah, I think remote is one thing and then working remotely with quarantine is another beast that we have to find with extra cautious. I just recently uh, ran to some of our team members feeling depressed because quarantine is taking away some of the, uh, the tips that Michael shared about, for example, commuting and then going to gyms are all part of the, their personal routine, but they are being taken away by the quarantine. So I think one thing, so we, I don't have an answer here, but one thing that really helped us is make this a specific, explicit goal for everyone to figure out, like we need to figure out a new, some replacements for the old personal routines and we have to figure out together. And this really helped us, you know, some, some of us replay some of the routines and find a new one. And then, yeah, that's a, some experience here by the quarantine. Do you, do any of you explicitly sort of on a daily basis, open up the discussion to just human quarantine issues? Like, we're gonna spend 15 minutes talking about like day-to-day -day stuff. Who's having trouble getting groceries? Who's having trouble with their kids? Who's, you know, st like, do any of you sort of do like, or do you wait for someone to try to bring that up or? We created a, a specific channel for it because one thing we found is it's, for some people, it's like pretty overwhelming to have it just constantly hitting them. And it, it is important to talk about. And so creating like a specific place for people to discuss it allows people to kind of moderate and mediate personally. Um, and then, you know, and everyone who um, has direct reports, uh, bringing it up during their one-on-ones and checking in on it explicitly, because it is, you know, a new, a new thing in everyone's life. But 
um, kind of found that everyone talking about it in the general channels or just like in public, um, it's just a lot to deal with. It makes it hard to focus. And uh, yeah. even though it's important to talk about, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it can be too much. Yeah, we, we found the same thing. So we, like I said, we, we had been planning on uh, our event contribute in Prague and, um, you know, before we even announced it publicly, we were working on canceling it and winding everyone down and, you know, moving 1200 people's flights. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and that channel about that event then became the news about, about the, uh, the virus. And literally, I, I mean, I think I was one of the people that, that felt overwhelmed, right? And we made a separate channel then like, okay, here's where we can discuss um, like COVID. There's also like a shelter in place channel that we made to talk specifically about sheltering in place um, and data around that. Um, our data team made it uh, a, a channel because um, they enabled, they brought actually into our data warehouse, a bunch of the COVID data from Hopkins so that folks can like learn how to use our data tools with that as like, I mean, that's how a lot of engineers maybe can process it better. It's like, let me do some, let me dig into the data and, and, and learn. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's really important, but I would say that the number one thing that's done is our, our leadership has made it front and center. Um, so we, we made a specific page in our handbook about it that specifically went to, so we obviously have a lot of different uh, benefits providers working in 65 different countries, but um, we made a list, you know, by country and by the provider, you know, what um, mental health and other benefits are like out there and, and how they re those folks are reacting to it um, so that people know what's going on. Um, we announced specifically a leave policy around COVID. Um, not everybody is lucky enough to be able to do that. We, you know, have a large team and, and have, have been back very well. And we've decided to give folks 12 weeks of leave if they're diagnosed or a family members diagnosed and they need to take care of them. Um, and, and writing that down and, and just saying it right then, I think alleviates a lot of the pressure and the, like the feeling of fear for some folks, right? Like it's your job's going to be there. Um, in our values, it says family and friends first. And um, I know that a number of our, our C-level um, folks have started their all hands with um, a slide that is about that. Like slide one of our marketing all hands after this was all happening was uh, our CMO saying, you know, family and friends first you're going to have to be working differently or, or working less. Um, and, and now let's talk about our goals. And of course it impacts our business, right? It impacts marketing and, and everything. Um, and, and it's great to talk about that too, but leading with that, um, our CRO shared that he is going to be modifying his schedule because his kids are home uh, and taking time off to help assist with that. Um, our VP of engineering did the same thing, said, Hey, I'm going to be, he said to all of engineering, again, it's all in public channels. He said, uh, I'm going to be resetting my expectations with my manager, aka our CR CEO, right? Um, and so he encouraged everyone to do the same if they need to. Uh, so I think uh, leaders, you know, truly leading in this time by example uh, can really have a huge impact on the team. Really well said. Really well said. And I, I'm keeping an eye on the time here. We're uh, we're closing in on an hour, so I'll, I'll kind of accelerate our conversation. And thank you guys for for sticking through this and making this such an awesome, awesome discussion. Um, one thing that I, I want to kind of promise, you know, all of our attendees um, before, before we kind of jump into our final discussion points here is that kind of what, uh, you know, what kind of practical, you know, tools or products you guys have found, you know, to be really effective. And Brendan, I, you know, you've got your microphone sitting in front of you, but um, obviously all of us have, you know, you know, Slack is obviously unbelievably prominent, Zoom, incredibly prominent. Um, Comcast Wi-Fi, I wouldn't recommend, um, <laughs> at least based off of today. Um, however, would love to kind of hear from you guys. You know, uh, you know, what what little things have you found? Could be could be dead easy, like a good chair, but like tools, services. You know, what what has helped you kind of work better in a, in a remote dynamic? I think my my two things that helped the most. One. I have the Logitech Brio 4K camera, which is the best webcam I've found. Um, it's great at picking up like lower light. It just makes everything look better. Um, so I'm going to probably go buy that. You do look great, Michael. Yeah, I, can find <laughs> um, and I know they've been sold out. It, it's used by like Twitch streamers. I mean, it's, it's, it's really fantastic. Um, the other one is my running shoes. I mean, that's like what keeps me sane. So I think like there's a lot of stuff that doesn't sit on your desk 
that you should think about as tools to help you work as a distributed team. Curious what other people think though. I, I would say just apropos, Max, I'm sorry that you've been having issues, but my, my father, who's much older, uh, um, obviously said this to me when I was going to be working remotely. He said, don't use your Wi-Fi. Plug your laptop in, Brendan. It's important you have yeah. <laughs> And I did. I like went through the effort of running a cable. Um, and so I'm, I mean, I have Wi-Fi in the house. And if I leave this desk, uh, I end up on Wi-Fi. But, um, you know, it's just the Zoom is, you know, not as, as friendly as everything else to packet loss, right? Uh, so... <laughs> I um I am plugged in when I'm at my desk, which can be hard. In fact, I'm talking about we're talking about moving my desk to get me some more natural light, um, which Michael was talking about. Um, and I'm the biggest concern I have about it is like I'm gonna have to get Ethernet up there somehow, probably, <laughs> to where that office is. It's an excellent point. So I would recommend a messaging app called Lark. So we switch over from uh, Slack to Lark over um, about a year ago. And uh, one, one killer feature um, of Lark is that it has auto translation feature. So we have engineers whose native language is French and also Chinese, they, they do speak English, but it would be super cool for them to actually speak their native language in Lark and they would be auto auto tra automatically translated to English. So everyone can speak their you know, native language in this app and then can still communicate, auto translation is perfect. So yeah, highly recommend that. Wow. Yeah, Absolutely. I can. Uh, yeah. I would. I would definitely throw a second endorsement on that one. Um, one of the of the cooler experiences I've ever had has been um, working with Lark because I've got some colleagues. Um, Ho Zhong and I obviously work together. Some colleagues that um, they either don't speak English or, or their English is very kind of basic. And I certainly don't speak Mandarin, um, but I have perfectly seamless collaborations with them on some pretty detailed technical topics. Um, all enabled through this auto translate, and um, you know, I've literally felt like you know a connection I've built with some of these people, you know, all, all through kind of the magic of this feature. So, um, yeah, I, I found that really exciting for sure. Yeah, that's really impressive. Yeah, I mean, I would say that's like our only limiting factor about where we can hire right now. I mean, well, there's a couple. We can't hire in U.S. Tr uh, sanctioned countries, but we also do say that we do business in English, right? And so that then limits us. Uh, to folks that can communicate in English. So that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the Another one I'll, I'll share, um, which I imagine is is nothing too exotic, but I'm, I'm sure all you guys have a good kind of setup at home. I, um, I've got this massive um, ultra wide monitor, um, which once I got set up about a year ago, I couldn't believe I'd gone a day without it, you know, where I'm able to multitask on the equivalent of probably four or five screens at any one time. Um, sometimes multitasking can be bad, of course. Uh, that's another discussion. But um, yeah, curious to kind of hear your guys, you know, what's, uh, what fundamentals do you have kind of set up for your kind of workstation at home? I was gonna mention one small point. I've noticed that like, so I just have like a, two monitors, right? But I notice, like, I tend to have the zoom like I do with you, but then I'm like looking over here, right? And so I notice a lot of people put their other monitor on top. So at least they're not quite, you know, the camera's here. They're not quite like looking away. It's might be a way to cheat that you're multitasking while you're on zoom, but it's helpful. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, to, in the spirit of time, we'll, we'll jump into our very final topic and we'll, we'll keep it brief. Um, but I, I think one of the one of the big challenges, especially we've talked a lot about, you know, synchronous versus asynchronous work, is this idea of you know setting setting goals, sharing those goals, tracking on them. Um, curious, curious, you know, and Hojong, um, I, I penciled you in to kind of you know kick off our discussion here. But yeah, curious, curious to hear, you know, what what everybody's experiences have been like in terms of figuring out like what are we tracking, how are we communicating the goal, and how do we figure out if we're making the right progress? Yeah, good question. So, so uh, in my opinion, uh, how to set goals and how to measure success has always been a problem, no matter if we are in the same space or working remote. Uh, for example, we still set our goals um, as the same way before while our weekly spring planning meeting. But working remote does pose some new challenges, um, I think in particular to the you know, to tracking progress of the team. So when you, 
can, when we are in the same physical space, we can have many casual conversations and checkings daily on a daily basis. But in a remote setting, having daily one-on-ones with every team member might be too heavy, uh, both for myself and for my team. So um, to, to give me more visibility into what um, the team is doing, um, I think we take two measures. First, we do daily scrum, like many of the teams do. This is a chance for a team to get together, define a plan for the day's work, and also identify any blockers. Secondly, we'll use some telemetrics to help us track progress and overall health of our code base. And when we find some existing metrics not good enough, then we will invent some of our own. Um, and all, all these telemetrics would provide an additional and quantitative channel for understanding how our team is doing. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. How do you get, um, how do you guys get buy-in from people on new goals and initiatives and things like that. One of the challenges I perpetually have always is sort of translating what might seem like an arbitrary business concern or arbitrary product direction or prioritization or whatever else to a team. And that requires, again, so much trust and so much rapport and so much buy-in and collaboration and stuff, especially for, for big switches, big pivots that half the team's not gonna agree with in their own judgment. How do you guys get do you have issues with those kind of buy-in or do those people just kind of get washed out if you don't naturally buy into stuff? Like, how do you, how do you deal with that? In the same vein, I, I guess, goals. It's a great question. It's really tough. I, my experience, one thing that works is having like one-on-one -on -one discussions with people you think either might be concerned um, about those. You could, you know, kind of uh, guess who that might be. Also people that end up being sort of, like the cultural glue that holds together the company, have conversations with them first. Um, anytime I'm going to announce anything big during an all hands meeting, I actually will have probably talked with over half the team one-on-one -on -one about that thing before. And so when I announce it or it's a big thing, it's not like the air goes out of the room, nobody's surprised. And uh, what also happens is the people I didn't talk to, you know, if they have questions or concerns, they don't come to me, they come to the other team members that they trust. And so there's already some kind of scaffold built up there. Um, it's tough for a big shift. If you're going to pivot the business, I could take like a few couple weeks, right? To have all those conversations and move people through it. Um, I think very rarely can you, you know, just grab the wheel of the ship and turn it as hard as you can and, and get people to come with you. If people really trust you as an organization and you're an amazing leader, you, you probably can do that, you know, once a quarter, maybe, um, probably even less frequently than that. Um, so I think it's, that's just a question of hard, leadership <laughs> yeah that's fair it's the same it's the same no matter where everyone's working actually yeah 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 i have found though like having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people that are sort of lieutenants in the company that lets it be scalable so then afterward you know people can come to them that might not want to ask the founder or ask their boss talk to their peers sort of a softer social structure absolutely Absolutely. Well, well, with that, um, being respectful of everybody's time, and, and certainly I imagine you guys are busy, um, we'll, we'll call, this, call this kind of adjourned, uh, since we're 10 minutes over, but the, the kind of summary I want to kind of leave everybody with, uh, you know, I think we, we touched upon some really interesting points, which is, you know, the importance of, you know, thinking about boundaries and, you know, how you're translating that into formal decisions with, you know, whether or not people have mobile apps configured on their phone or if they've got notifications set up. Um, I love the point that Michael Rice brought up, you know, kickstarting the week with a team-wide communication. Um, I think we talked about a lot of interesting things here with regard to, you know, how do you, how do you drive kind of real kind of friendly conversation and culture through leveraging all of the different channels and all of the different, you know, communication platforms that you have at your disposal and how you can be a bit more precise about that. Um, Brendan, I think, brought up a, a really great point, you know, um, that we discussed, you know, about not, not leaving things all in DMs and finding ways to kind of keep communication a little more obvious and a little more clear to everybody, keep people feeling engaged. Um, I think, uh, you know, we talked about some of the, the basics of, I've certainly, you know, got a takeaway here, which is I'm going to walk away and immediately hook up an Ethernet cable here at my uh, home, <laughs> home desk, um, you know, at a... I think uh, all of these things are, are super important. And um, if I've left, you know, with any one key thing, I would say, you know, it's, it's the importance of just remembering at the end of the day, it's just human beings working together. And, you know, we've got to be thinking about, you know, how all of these different weird dynamics affect our ability to communicate and our ability to, to feel like we're a part of something. So um, 
wanting to give all of you a quick, uh, quick uh, soapbox here. If there's any one last thought you want to leave with or any last thing you want to kind of announce or share, um, feel free. I'll um, go down the line here. Um, Jason, if you want to say anything. No, I think we've covered a lot. I, I certainly don't have any sort of personal stuff to announce, but I, I think this has been really great. I, I hope that we can do more of these group chats. Just talking to you guys has been really, really, really interesting. And it's it's nice to like, because otherwise you're isolated, right? You're just hanging out in your house. And these things are great. Thanks for organizing it. Nice. Absolutely. Thanks for joining. Brendan. Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I will shamelessly plug the fact that we write everything down. Um, so I'm not that smart but we've written all this stuff down. Uh, so if you Google GitLab remote playbook, we've got a like actually a downloadable ebook you can pull out down that has like all of our thoughts about remote. Um, but then that page also has like everything you can think of about how to go remote as an employee, how to go remote kind of in a, in a hurry in an emergency like a lot of us are finding right now. Um, it talks about mental health. It talks about how to structure your day. It talks about how to hire. Um, so take a look at that um, for a lot more thoughts about how we we think about remote absolutely uh michael work work os michael first um <laughs> one tactical thing so i tweeted this uh if you go check out my twitter profile i think it's one of the first top ones chrome in a recent update removed the ability to automatically open links with a certain mm -hmm. command and so when you open a zoom link you have to click every single time there is a little command that you can run in your terminal which will re-enable this and so if you're opening a Zoom link, it'll just open right up in Zoom. I have a thread with like about 10 really quick tips on how to use Zoom and it makes life so much better. I recommend check that out and run that command. Love it, love it. And I'll, I'll quickly also push uh, Michael's product to um, really cool solution for um, single sign-on that I, I think we're probably gonna figure out if we can use for our product too. So uh, check it, check him out, work OS. Um, Michael Rice, any, uh, any parting thoughts? Yeah, no, just, uh, you know, just with working remotely, this is not normal working remotely, like we've said a few times here. <laughs> so if you are kind of uneasy about it, just remember, this is kind of a really weird time. I, I used to, one of the things I loved about working remote is I'd be like, I'd go to like three different places in one day, right, and just work in different locations. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, like I always say, like with humans, I think when we're remote, we have a, such a strong tendency to focus on tools, which is inevitably as engineers, we tend to focus then on efficiency. But remember with humans, efficiency is, effectiveness is way more important than efficiency. So just keep that in mind. It's a great way to say it. Hojong, any, uh, any final thoughts? Really enjoyed the conversation, learned a lot of pro tips, stay hydrated, get good lighting, and uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation in the future. And one last thing, can we get a link, an uh, Amazon link to the best camera that we have? Def definitely oh, we'll yeah, that it's super chat. sold out <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I was gonna say for um, for, for all of the attendees to um I'll, I'll be making sure to gather all of this stuff and i'll, I'll share it with everybody as a follow-up um as well as a link to the recording um and then one last you know note um and i'll share this with with everybody um, at the end of april we'll be having our our second remote round table um some of our panelists here may may join if they're up for it they're certainly welcome um, but we'll also bring some new people into the conversation too. Um, and this time inspired by a conversation I had with Jason, actually, we're going to talk about some of the challenges in managing conflict and keeping harmony between in, in office on-site teams and distributed and remote teams and managing the, managing the challenges there. So I think that'll be a really brilliant discussion and I'm, I'm excited to have it. So um, thank you everybody. Um, thank you all the panelists for your time and going over here. Um, really fantastic conversation. And I um, really appreciate everybody being a part of this. So, so thank you for tuning in and um, we'll see you on the next one.